ability to include an Oscar in a speaker, because that would be a very uh, dangerous spot. First of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I am, like many people here, uh, on my first visit. And, um, because you did some. Yeah. Quietly tan. Okay. Um, I'm on my first visit here, and it's just, and it's an extraordinary thing you've done. And um, uh, the list of people that you've got coming to speak, and just the nature of it in this particular location is uh, not only an amazing achievement, but I think an extremely worthwhile undertaking. So I feel very, very fortunate to be here. Um, I, I was going to warble on, if I might, just for 10 minutes or so about understanding and covering China, and I hope have a conversation, as David says, about anything you choose, whether on the BBC, the political environment here, the uh, nature of uh, reporting in China, or, or, or any other issue that you think uh, grabs your attention. Um, I was a reporter in, uh, in China, in Shanghai, from 1996 to about 2000. That time I was working for the Financial Times, and if you want to get a sense of how easy it was to be a reporter in China at that time, um, I'll tell you the story about my landlady, Mrs. Jian. Mrs. Jian um, had uh, uh, rented her house to me. It was a it was a flat just behind Song Qingling's old house uh, on Huaihai Lu in the in the old uh, 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 French concession of uh, Shanghai. And, and Mrs. Jiang uh, was a wonderful, um, but really quite intrusive lady. And she didn't have the same sense of personal privacy um, that I've had with other landladies. And I remember about quarter to seven one morning, a key turning the door of this flat, and the clomp clomp of Mrs. Jiang's feet on the stairs. And she opened the door to my bedroom, came in, and said, uh, said, good morning, James. <laughs> and I leant over the sheet and I said, uh, good morning, Mrs. Chuck. <laughs> uh, nice to see you. <laughs> and, um, and she always was very proud of the fact she called me James. She never called me by my Chinese name, which was a good thing because I had, uh, I, I, I learned a very bad Chinese up in Beijing. And, um, and at the end of the first week, they asked us to make up our own names. And like you'll find with many, many foreigners who go to work in China, we do what we're told. We say, okay, we'll, we'll choose our own names. And so I chose my Chinese name, and I was extremely pleased with it. It was Ji Ming Shi, Ji as in Ji Li, good fortune, Ming as in Ming Bai, to see or understand, and Shi as in Shi Ji. And I thought, this is brilliant. I am very fortunate to understand the world. I thought it was great. It would be the equivalent of a Chinese person moving here and calling themselves Vanilla Bubblegum. I don't the silliest <laughs> name you could possibly have. Except that when you moved to Shanghai, it was even worse, because the Shanghainese pronunciation of those characters was Jinningzen, which is a, a little bug that lives under a bed. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and Mrs. Jung was too polite to call me Jinningzen, so she would always call me James. And she said, good morning, James. It's about 10 to 7 in the morning. She said, I just wanted to stop by and let you know that I'm going away. I said, okay. very nice to know, Mr. Jack, have a very nice time. And she said, yes, I'm going to be uh, uh, leaving uh, tomorrow. And I said, that's great, have a good time. When are you back? Next week. She said, I said, great. Yeah, I'm leaving the country tomorrow, I'll be back next week. I said, great. This is about late, must be early, late 97, maybe? And this sort of rather puzzle exchange continues. And so I said, by the way, Mr. where are you going? She says, I'm leaving the country. I'm going to Thailand. I said, oh, I haven't been to Thailand before. She said, no, I've never left the country before. Suddenly I twig that she's come to tell me because she is one of the first wave of people in Shanghai who's managed to get a tourist visa. And in, at that stage, it was there were very few countries that were allowing Chinese people to come on tourist visas. In fact, in the, in the region that we were in, from Shanghai, Thailand was the first place. And Mrs. Jan left my bedroom. I rolled over in bed. I had a phone by the bed. I remember calling the foreign desk of the Financial Times and saying, I think I might have a story on Chinese tourism. Are you interested? And they said, yes, we'll take 800 words. And there was a time when covering China was extremely easy. The simple fact 
of China's integration with the world, its engagement with the world, every element of it was extraordinary to the rest of the world. And the story that I covered when I was in China was, it's all about to happen. This was, this was, the, this was the, if you like, the one simple narrative was, here comes China. Right? Now, arguably, you could say that had been the case since the early 90s. Um, but it was so self-evident by the late 1990s that it was going to have a, an absolutely transformational effect on the world. And I remember 10 years after that, I ended up sitting at a lunch in London. It was a lunch of luxury goods operators. And I sat next to someone who had the Rolex shop in Knightsbridge. It was the Rolex shop uh, just uh, near the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. And at that time, it had the highest rent per square foot of any uh, shop in London. And I said to him, how, how is that the case? How is it you can afford? Because I never seem to see anyone going in and out of that shop. And he explained that when Chinese parents come and pick up their children at the beginning, at the end of the boarding school term, or at the beginning of the new one, they'll often stop by and buy a few Rolex watches. <laughs> and I remember thinking, in the time from Mrs. Jung walking into my bedroom to the time that I had that conversation, what had happened was the, the promise of China had become a reality. It had happened. And, and I say that in that kind of light-hearted way, but I think if you look around at the news of the moment, the fact that China has happened, the fact that the story is no longer the promise of China, but the reality of it, is something that we're still struggling to really understand and really appreciate. And I'll give you two much more substantial examples, if you like. Let's take the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank. The idea that China has become the sponsor of a multilateral financial institution is, on the face of it, a quite uh, remote, uh, possibly rather bureaucratic and dusty story. But what, it's, what it says, to me at least, is that a conversation that existed in the corridors of power in Beijing, in the corridors of power in Washington, for pro possibly two decades, has gone from being a conversation to a fact. That conversation was about the prospect of a much more powerful Chinese economy rewiring the world financial system as part of a wholesale um, effort to address the ways in which, if you like, the Western powers had set up the global rules, the global networks, the global institutions in the wake of the Second World War. China, it seems, is beginning to do that in the way in which financial institutions and soon diplomatic institutions and no doubt military um, uh, cooperation will be run. And what struck me about that was things that people had said would happen are happening. So I remember when Xi Jinping uh, took over, in fact, in the year or so uh, beforehand, people were very interested in what was happening inside the uh, party school and the kind of academic work that was going on there. And, and someone pointed out to me that Chinese leaders in the run-up to taking over uh, the responsibility for running the People's Republic of China have asked for a big piece of academic work on the state of the world. Uh, Mao himself had done it, uh, and Mao's, um, or the conclusions of Mao's officials were, was that when he took over, the world was in for a period of instability, uh, a great deal of uh, uh, military squirt skirmishes that would be uh, offshoot of the Cold War, uh, a great deal of uncertainty in world affairs. When Deng took over, the, the officials around Deng said, you would see a great a world of economic competition but you wouldn't see the same uh, expressions of military uh, adventurism by the great powers. One of the arguments that people uh, uh, put for the decision by Deng to move away from investment in the PLA and, in, uh, and, and invest instead in the peacetime economy. But with Xi Jinping, the story that you're told is that the party school looked really, really seriously at the world and concluded that in, in relative terms, Western economic powers would decline, and that this would force the world to rethink the global diplomatic and economic architecture. 
take a, set, a second example, an example um, that I was going to show you, uh, which, which touches upon a piece of uh, BBC reporting. For a long, long time, no one could quite uh, accept the idea that the huge disparity between the life that you saw Chinese people living uh, along the coast, uh, along the coast, and the life of Chinese people uh, inland. Yeah, I'll play that in a second. This is the bit where I get to walk up. That is, that no, no one, I think, entirely uh, saw a way that China was going to bridge that gap between what was happening uh, in the east of the country and the west. And it was a policy priority, but it seemed the gap was so, so large. Certainly, even 15 years ago, when I was reporting from uh, you know villages outside, just just 50 miles from Chengdu, they seemed like. A, a light years away from the life which is being led by people in Tianjin or Shanghai or Beijing. And, and I had, um, and, and, and this piece of reporting by Carrie Gracie really struck me as an example of the way in which that east west divide within China has very profoundly changed. And, and, and one of the reasons I, I just wanted to point it out to you was China, as for a journalist, is quite a difficult story to tell. It's quite a difficult story to tell because it's not a story of events. If you look at the Middle East, the Middle East is a story of quite often really, really um, uh, eye-catching, often shocking and very uh, upsetting, but very eye-catching events. China is generally a story of developments. And how you capture that in a way that um, that people who have not witnessed it can truly appreciate is one of the real challenges of reporting China. But what I wanted to say to you was that the fundamental change between East and West, it strikes me that not entirely, but very substantially, that's happened too. There was a, there was a really important uh, and interesting piece of work at the FT earlier this year about what was happening to migrant labour in China and the fact that you weren't seeing the same drain of people from West to East. Partly because what you see in places like White Horse Village in Wuxi County is a total, total change to the landscape. And I just recommend this piece, give me while I scoot over here. I just recommend you taking a look at it. it uh, our China editor is a woman called Carrie Gracie. And she went to and did a, spent the better part of a year and a half in this little village in Wuxi, in, uh, oh, thank you very much. Hello there. Hello there. Uh, in Wuxi in 2005. And she went back and saw the same town and the same family 10 years later, just 10 years later. And this village, which had been the home to about 3,000 people, well, the Wuxi population has just uh, eaten it up. And it's now home to about 200,000 people. And this this scene. Uh, let's see if I can do this. This scene has given has given way to this scene. Uh, and the transformation of a country that is often something we have to live with in our minds actually has played out. And it's worth having a look at this piece. Take a look at it. It's on white horse village. I just want to. I just want to finish up, though, if I may. Thanks, Thanks very much. I just want to finish up, though, if I may, by by just trying to address a question, which is: given that these things have happened, given that you're seeing this transformation of the economy, given that you're seeing the transformation of the landscape of China, why is it that in the last six, maybe eighteen months, you're seeing a greater bearishness, particularly amongst Westerners, around China and the Chinese economy? I personally think that's, that's rather overdone. I think the strength of the Chinese economy and the strength of what's happening in China is, is, is so significant that uh, it's much too easily underestimated. But I do think there's one really significant issue that, um, that is still under, un, that we still need to really get our arms around and begin to understand properly. And that is the extent to which you're beginning to see the notion of the rule of law in China used as a lever of state power. And if you like, I'll give you just one example of it. 
and, a, and, and use it as an, a way of illustrating why I think you're seeing greater nervousness around China, even amongst people who, in the last 10, 20 years, have been enthusiasts for China. I spoke to someone who ran a mining, runs a mining company. When they did a big mining deal, they um, were looking, they, they were told that as part of the deal they had to sell one big copper mine. It was clear that China wanted to buy this big copper mine. It was in Latin America. There was quite a lot of anxiety when the boss of this business went to Beijing to try and do the deal with officials from the state council. It was a long and torturous negotiation through the week, and by the time they got to Friday evening, no deal had been done. So the boss of this business said, well, we haven't got a deal, that's fine, I'm going home. They went out for dinner on Friday night, he was due to take a plane on Saturday afternoon. On Saturday morning, the head of his local Chinese business came to him and said, we have to do a deal. And he said, well, we don't have the price. You know, we've made very clear what the price is. We don't have the price. And the local Chinese head of the Chinese uh, office of this international company said, I've had a call from an official of the state council, and they've explained to me that if we don't agree a price today, on Monday our offices will be raided. And when our offices are raided, they will find something. And the boss of this international business said, well, I'm sure they won't find anything we're completely above board. And he said, yes, we are completely above board, but trust me, they will find something. <laughs> and when they find something, what will happen is we will start a process, which will start with me, the Chinese uh, boss of the Chinese uh, division, said, going to prison for a couple of years while we try to resolve it. To cut a long story short, by the end of the day, at the end of that Saturday, they had agreed a price. But what has happened that is fundamentally different from the world that I was used to when I arrived in China in 1996 mm. to today in 2015, is that the dynamic has changed. And what you are seeing, I think, is a much greater level of nervousness among uh, international investors looking at China and looking in particular at the extent to which the quote-unquote purge on corruption is also spilling over into the use of the rule of law as an extension of state power and a way in which the party can assert itself. Um, there are many people in this room who even just looking around have a, have a depth of knowledge about China and the cycles of history in China. And I think many people appreciate that, that Xi Jinping appears to be in that tradition. Um, it is, I think, one of the great themes of reporting and covering China now is to try and understand that relationship between the party, the rule of law, and the free market, a, a, a relationship which I think is causing some nervousness and some degree of misunderstanding. I'll finish up there except to say one final thing, which is that when Mrs. Jiang returned a week later from her holiday in Thailand, she also intruded early in the morning on me at home, and she came in with a pile of photographs, which I duly looked at every one. And when I asked her, did she love it? She said, it was very nice, but I missed the food. I, I entirely understand how she feels having lived in Shanghai for a few years. I really miss the food.